as you embark on your career, um, I have found to be one of the single most important and yet really obvious keys to success. And part of this, p part of my coming around to this topic was really out of a need of the, to respond to questions I was always being asked, saying, you know, you've met a lot of people. If you had to name one thing that is most highly correlated with successful people, what would it be? And I didn't, frankly, a few years ago, I didn't have a great answer for it. So the more I thought about it, I kind of came to the conclusion that self-awareness is probably the single most important thing, as obvious as it is. So what we're going to talk a little bit about in the next few minutes is exactly what I mean by self-awareness, a little head check on whether you really are self-aware, why it matters, and then how you'll know as you embark on your career, how you'll know whether you're actually you know, following the script. Now you may say, well, I'm self-aware, everybody I know is self-aware, like the facts tell a different story. Every company I've worked in, every team I've worked on, doesn't matter where it is, 80% of the people who work with you think they're in the top quartile. So as long as 80% think they're in the top quartile and the math of that simply doesn't work, by definition, a majority of that 80% must be wrong. Right? They must not be self-aware enough to know where they stack up. The other thing that people are never honest about, right? If I asked people in a room, no matter how big or small, how many of you suck up to your boss? No one puts their hand up. If I ask a group of managers, how many of you guys like being sucked up to? No one puts their hand up. But sucking up is rampant in corporate America, right? People do it. People like having it done to them, and yet no one admits it, right? So people are not honest all the time about their own performance, their ability to, to, to manage through things. So the average person is actually not very self-aware. And we're kind of trained as young people now not to be, right? If you get a participation trophy that builds your self-esteem for everything in which you participate, it's not your fault if you start thinking you're good at everything, right? It's not going to help you to think you're good at everything. And to make you feel better, the human being who is great at everything has yet to be created by God. They do not exist. We all have strengths and weaknesses. So, so what's the easiest way to try to visualize this? Let's just use this screen right over here for fun because it's a nice little visual. Think of a quadrant that looks very simply like that. And along this axis, uh, along this axis you have things you don't like to do. And, and going over to things I like to do. And on this, axis you have, on this axis, you have things I'm not terribly good at, things I'm good at. Simple little visual, right? It's stuff we've been doing all our life. So what's the most important outcome of that? If you really sit down and do it and fill a chart out as sophomoric as it sounds, it's an interesting test. I'm sure most of you have never done it. Most people my age have never done it. So when someone comes to me and says, hey, can I get some mentoring advice? I say to them, until you fill out this chart, I'm in no position to give you advice. Because I shouldn't tell you to chase after things that aren't in the upper right quadrant, that aren't in your power zone. So what this will help you do is, you want to live up here, right? You want to live in the quadrant that says, I found a job that I really like, that I'm passionate about, that happens to be nicely aligned with my skill set. It sounds so obvious that you would ask, well, if it's that obvious, A, why is this idiot talking to us about it if it's that obvious? And B, like, doesn't everybody already do this? I'm sad to report that most people don't do this. They're constantly taking jobs that are not aligned with their skill set and passions. They're chasing after the wrong things. They talk themselves into doing jobs they shouldn't do, right? So if you, if, if you do nothing, take nothing else away from the 10 minutes, we're going to be together. I, I swear to you, it is worth doing this exercise. I promise you it will pay dividends. And it's something you can go back to. It's something you can go back to. Now, now why does it matter? Because it, it matters for a whole host of reasons. The first thing is, if you really get comfortable with your strengths and weaknesses, and you know what you bring to the table, 
and you're equally aware of what you don't bring to the table, it turns out every day is a pretty good day. Because a lot of the stress we have is, am I going to be found out for this thing that I'm pretending to know that I'm really not, or a strength I'm pretending to have that I really don't have? Let me give you a really easy example. I, it may not look like it in the shape I'm in at the moment, but I play basketball every Saturday with the same group of guys I played with since we were in our 30s, which was a long time ago. Um, I have one position on the team. I'm not confused about my role. I'm very self-aware when it comes to basketball. I'm a shooting guard, and it turns out I suck at the other four positions. I'm not, I have no problem with that. I've been playing my whole life. If I were destined to be a point guard, I've had 50 years to figure it out, and I haven't figured it out yet. I don't see this way, so I can't be, I can't be the point guard. So the guys I play with want me to work on one thing and only one thing. They want me to be the best shooting guard I can be at 57 years old, right? If I, came, if I go there Saturday and go, and, hey, I was with a bunch of young people, I get really fired up, I get all stoked up here, I'm ready to go, I'm going to play power forward this Saturday? Their answer should be, no, you're not. If you want to fantasize about playing at a position on our team, find another team. Now, that happens in business all the time. Right? So what you have to figure out is, what position are you best suited? Which position lines up with your strengths? Because then you're putting yourself in a position to, to succeed. Right? So again, why does it matter? If you look at the history books, how many successful business people do you think we're going to find who spent their entire life and career here doing things they hate that they weren't terribly good at. They're not going to be successful, so you're never going to read about those people. You're going to read about people who spent their career figuring out what pitches can I hit, what pitches can I hit, what roles can I play, what roles can I play, and then they're secure. Like, I, I, I'm totally fine that I can't, I, I can't jump. Why would I think I could play the, on the forward line of a basketball team? I can't. Now, how does that start to translate to work? At one point in my career at the NYSE, I went to my uh, head of HR, and I said, Philippe, I know this is unconventional, but it strikes me that we've got this whole review process backwards. I said, we give people a 60-minute annual review, and we spend 50 minutes on their weaknesses and 10 minutes on their strengths. I said, I realize, like, for a group, you know, your age, we can still mold you. If you have some weaknesses that aren't fatal to your success, it's probably worth the investment because you're young enough that if we make the right investment, if we tailor it properly, there's a chance we could turn something that you're not fantastic at into at least a moderate strength. When I, when I was having this conversation with Philippe, I was 53 years old. And I said, Philippe, it's not that I haven't been trying. Like, I'm pretty sure who I am at this point is hardwired. I don't know why we would invest in my weaknesses anymore. I'm not going to invest in my weaknesses anymore. I embrace them. I enjoy them. I wear them with pride. And if we think something that I'm no good at at 53, I'm going to be a superstar at at 60, mm, the odds say no chance. But if I'm pretty good at something at 53, I bet you guys can help me be awesome at that by 60. Because I've already evidenced that that's a strength of mine. So we turned the review process completely on its head. And we started to say to people more, hey, let's just agree what your weaknesses are. If we think it's important and you're young enough that it's still not hard, it's not hardwired yet, we're going to give you a plan to work, to work on it. But actually, we're going to spend more time investing in your strengths because we think the return on investment is higher. Now, why do I like working with self-aware people? Because if they're, if they're truly self-aware, they're super secure in who they are. They don't come in asking to play out of position. They don't get nervous about someone replacing them because you've been very transparent with them when we've said, you're here to play this role, you're here to play this role, compliment each other, don't be nervous about pushing each other out of the way because we need both of you. It's empowering. And I watched it be empowering to the people who were working with us. It's like the self-aware people are better team builders. 
and they're better teammates because they know what they bring to the table and they've had a discussion about what they don't. So it makes it very easy to manage those people. They're good teammates, right? Because they know what's being asked of them. And most importantly, they know what's not being asked of them. And then as a leader, I just have to be consistent. I can't tell you I'm expecting this from you and I'm never gonna expect this from you because I don't think it's your strength. And then two weeks later say, you know, you're fired because you didn't do that. I, I can't do that. But we have to have an honest, open conversation. And I've watched it really, really work. And it's not only important when you're young, it gets increasingly important when you move up the ladder, right? Like the more senior you get, it is a fact of life in spite of no one admitting it that you get more positive feedback the more senior you are, right? More people tell you all your jokes are funny, more people tell you all your ideas are great, and it turns out they're not. So the first thing I did when I, I, I was president of the NYSE on a Friday, I was CEO on the following Monday. The first meeting we had that Monday morning, I called my team in and I said, I wanna be very clear about something. I didn't get smarter over the weekend. The stuff I didn't know on Friday, I still don't know. And the stuff I was no good at on Friday, I'm destined to be no good at because I'm too old to turn that weakness into a strength. So please don't kiss my ass. Please don't start acting differently with me. The only thing that changed over the weekend was my title. So I, I said, I need you guys around me. You gotta be truth tellers. We have to challenge each other like we did last Friday, right? And we've all, we all know what we bring to the table. That's how the team was assembled. I, I knew what I was lacking versus what the company needed and I hired accordingly and that's how I built the team. I'll leave you with one thought in conclusion. The way you'll know is if you're really following this ethos is every opportunity that's presented to you at your firm that you're at or another firm you're thinking about going to, you got to run it through this filter. The job you're in right now, you should run through this filter. This, if you're still in college and you're thinking about embarking on a career search, run it through this filter. It's a very interesting test to see if you can truly articulate your likes and dislikes, your weaknesses and your strengths. Because if we, if we are constantly positioning ourselves to go to that upper right quadrant, we're much less likely to talk ourselves into jobs that we shouldn't do, right? And look, sometimes it's the allure of the almighty dollar, right? I get it. I mentor people and they come to me and say, you know, I'm thinking about taking this job, what do you think? said, I think that would be the dumbest career decision you could make. And they look at you and say, you're supposed to be my mentor. You're supposed to be supportive. You're supposed to be telling me every, you know, everything's great. I'm like, no, I'm not. Find another mentor if that's what you want a mentor to be. Like, I'm not here to be a sycophant. I'm here to tell you, like, your head's up your backside if you take that job. And then when you explain to them in this context, like, that job's going to require you to be great at three things you're not good at. Like, why would you do that? Well, you know, it's more money. Great. Okay, there's a great old Dominion song for country music fans in the room, of which I, am, I may be the only one, but that's okay. There's a great old Dominion song, and one of the lines in the old Dominion song is, chase after the dream, don't chase after the money. Right, so your job is figure out what your dream is by doing this exercise and spend your life trying to spend as much time as you can in the upper right quadrant. It sounds super simple. I'm just telling you the majority of people don't live their life that way and do not execute career decisions that way. And if you can do it, you, you'll be more comfortable at work, you'll be a more productive person at work, and then you, you'll be constantly positioning yourself for success because you, you know what your role on the team is and you can go out and be great at that role, and then you will be valuable no matter where you are. So John, thanks for having me. Thank you. Thank you guys for listening, appreciate it.